Hi, my name is Elijah, and I have the privilege to serve as the creative pastor here at City Life Church. We just wanted to quickly thank you. Thank you for tuning in wherever you may be watching from. Hey, if you haven't already, please go ahead and click the like and subscribe button. We believe that God has an amazing word for you today. So let's jump into today's message. Some of us are uncomfortable with silence, aren't we? We don't always know what to do in a quiet moment. Our lives are so filled with noise and busyness and sounds and things that it's often hard for us to still ourselves in a place of solitude, in a place of rest. And I want to talk today, I want to share a little bit from my heart on this topic, an invitation to rest. As you know, we have been discussing sila. Sila, this is the fourth and final message in this series, and I pray that you're taking it to heart. I pray that it's not just you coming for these last three weeks or when you can be here that you've just checked off a box and said, I came to church because that's my religious obligation, but that you have come and that you have received because this message has the power to change your life. It truly does not because I'm speaking it or not because another of our pastors have spoken it, but the word of God has power, it has life, and it has the ability to rearrange. It has the ability to shift. It has the ability to bring about a revolution in our life today. And so I pray that you're leaning in and I pray that you will lean in today with me because the words that I wanna share are very important and very particular. Sila. Let's go back through our definition together because some of you might not have been here for this beautiful series that we have been in together. The word sila means this, to pause, to rest, to reflect, to worship, and to refocus. An alternate definition is an invitation from God to rest and to worship. Most of us have a, have a difficulty finding a place of rest. Would you agree? We are somewhat addicted to adrenaline in our culture. We don't know how to slow down, and that is true of most of us as Americans. In fact, studies show that we are sleep deprived, and in fact, we're two hours less, we have two hours less sleep than we did 50 years ago. Isn't that interesting? We're moving through life in such a distracted way that We don't ever stop and rest and think about what we're saying, about what we're doing. Even if what we're saying and doing is worth anything. We just move through life in such a way at a rapid pace that we just look at our to-do list and we walk through it and we check it off and we, even in coming to church, it's an obligation. We just simply go along with the fact that our Western world mentality is that we're busy. We're just busy people. But I want us today to take a self-examination quiz. Okay, don't get nervous. Do not get nervous. Everybody, there were some of you like, a quiz? A quiz? Just process with me for a moment. You don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to shout out, yes. Listen, in the first service and at Eastlake, I've just come from Eastlake, when I would go through these questions, people were like, "Mm mm-hmm, yes, oh, yeah. And I'm trying to give you guys grace, like you don't have to give yourself away, but City Life is just a responsive group of people, and I love you for that. You're amazing. You're amazing. But listen, I'm trying to protect you. So if you don't want to say yes, then don't say yes, okay, my people? Listen, are you always in a hurry? Oh. (laughs) I knew it was gonna happen. You are my people. It's me, God, I'm the one. (laughs) Is your to-do list always unrealistically long? Do you use days off to catch up on unfinished work? Has more than one person ever told you to slow down? Do you feel guilty when you rest or when you relax? Do you have to get sick to get time off? Listen, there is an epidemic of exhaustion in our culture. 
We have fatigued minds and we're bombarded with information constantly. Did you know that your app has the ability to silence notifications? Did you know that? Some of you just want to be alerted 24 hours a day of what's happening. Who's, who's written on your, uh, you know, your, your IG post? I mean, why? Why do we want to know? Why do we want to be bothered by that every moment of our day? Because it's affecting our ability to process so much so that our memory is beginning to slip and our creativity is beginning to fade. And we always settle, we seem to settle for the short term. We have inconsistent emotions, don't we? We've all come from work and we've, we've lashed out at somebody and then our first response is, where did that come from? I can tell you where it came, came from because out of control emotions reflect an out of control pace. We have damaged relationships in our culture. Whether it's an undernourished marriage, whether it's a, a distracted parent, or a slow fade of a friendship in your life, we have become tired. And because we are tired, everybody around us is affected by our attitude. We're lacking faith. It's a sign when you're at capacity. It's a sign that you're at capacity when you start skipping church because of your busy schedule. Oh, I just have this to do. Oh, I have this to do. I have to, I have to run over here and then I gotta do that and then I gotta take my baby to the ball field. What about church? Your definition of prayer is quickly just running through your list, and your, your definition of reading your Bible is you waking up with drool on the pages of your scripture. <laughs> when your faith becomes an obligation, then your life has become overextended. I'm concerned that our attempts at rest are not working. You see, within the next few weeks, we'll go back to our routine. School will start, the fall semester begins, our babies will go off to college, grade school. Some of you who've had the summer off will start back to work. Some of you have even had vacations, but you came back more tired than when you went on vacation. We take sleep medication, we stroll through social media, but we're exhausted as a people. We're exhausted. Can I tell you today that God considers rest as important as work? Some of you think that God only smiles at you when you're praying, when you're worshiping, when you're coming to church to do your obligatory prayer. But God smiles on you when you rest. All the mothers and fathers in the room will know what I'm talking about. Did, have you ever walked over to your infant laying in the crib just to watch that baby sleep, just to look at their little chest, go up and down. I will find myself, even today, my babies are not babies anymore, they're teenagers, but I will still find myself sitting across the table just staring at them like this. <laughs> do you think they like it? <laughs> they absolutely hate it. Every time I do it, they're like, mom, really? Mom, stop staring at me, what's wrong with you? Like, you're gonna know someday. You will know when I'm, why, why I feel this way, why I can't take my eyes off of you. You're just too good to be true. You feel like heaven to touch. Oh, okay, sorry. Let me go back. This just that quickly, how it just you can break out into song. Shouldn't life be like musical theater? Shouldn't we just like every moment that we feel something like, ah! I mean, I'm just saying. I think life would be so much more fun. I digress. Let me get back to my scripture here. It would be so much fun though, right? I think there'd be a lot more happy people in the, in the world. Just break into dance and song in the middle of the street. Don't do it today on Del Mabry, but <laughs> please. My pastor said to go out and just break. Yeah, no, please. You, yeah, let's be careful. Um, where was I? Oh, yes. The Father smiles on us when we rest. Why is that important? Let's look at scripture right here. Exodus 31, verse 17. This day will always serve as a reminder, both to me and to the Israelites, that I made the heavens and the earth in six days. Then on the seventh day, I rested and relaxed. Who is this speaking right here? Speak back to me. This is God. So God rests, yes? So if God rests, then why don't you? Can I ask you a question today? Are you busier than God? Are you? I don't think we are. 
I don't think we are. But there's an invitation that he's extending to us. The Father, our Father, is extending an invitation to us to have Selah moments in our journey. But before we move on, let's just take a deeper look at the word rest. I want you to understand today that rest reveals our spiritual condition. Church attendance, total verses read, amount of money given. These are all beautiful and wonderful things that define spiritual things, correct? Obviously, they matter, but you would be surprised to learn that rest is one of the most accurate gauges of our relationship with God. Leviticus 23, verse 1. Let me teach you for a moment. The Lord said to Moses, give the following instructions to the people of Israel. Then the Lord's appointed festivals, which you are to proclaim as official days for holy assembly. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of complete rest. Everybody say that with me. Complete rest. An official day for holy assembly. Now listen, there are 44 verses in this chapter and the phrase, do not work, appears in verses 7, in verse 8, 21, 25, 28, 30, 31, and 36. Awesome. Why are you quoting all of those numbers to me today? PK. Listen, the importance is to understand that that's repeated nearly one in every four verses. Why is it so important to God that we rest? Because exhaustion is a spiritual problem. It is not a schedule problem. Here's what I know. You cannot give to the world or to anyone else what you do not possess. And in fact, what you do is important, but who you are is even more important. Some of us are so busy that we don't even know who we are anymore because we're walking through life busy under Satan's yoke. Did you know that that's an acronym for busy? Busy under Satan's yoke. The state you are in is the state you give to others. And your level of rest reveals this. It reveals where your identity lies. It was a famous philosopher who coined the phrase, I think, therefore I am. But for the Israelites coming out of slavery in Egypt, their lives were defined by this. And this is important for us to understand. I work, therefore I am. I work, therefore I am. This is a fundamental identity that their life was all about work. And today, things are not much different in our culture. I think most of us have convinced ourselves that being busy is a badge of honor. I'm busy. I'm important. Everybody needs me. If I don't lead worship, then it's really not going to be awesome. Even when I'm tired, I'm not going to take time off. In fact, if I were to ask you the next 10 people that you see when you leave church today, ask them, how have you been? How are you? What do you think their first response is going to be? Busy. I'm busy. I bet you 10 out of 10. I know we don't bet in church, but I'm just saying. (laughs) I would imagine that 10 out of 10, that's exactly what's going to come out of the mouth of the person that you're around and the person that you're speaking to. Why is that the case? Why is that okay? It's not okay. And we need to do something about it. Busyness has become our means of identity. But can I tell you that overworking hides feelings of inadequacy? I'm sorry to step on your toes today, and I have big shoes on, so I know it's going to hurt. I'm so sorry. But overworking hides feelings of inadequacy because your life cannot possibly be trivial or meaningless if, if you're not in demand. As long as we keep busy, We can mute that internal voice that plays over and over and over again inside of us that says, I'm not good enough, I'm not valuable enough, I'm I'm not successful enough. Some of us have the echo of that in our spirit today, but the Lord wants to heal you of that. You, You fail to realize that when your accomplishments become your identity, that you have become a human doing and not a human being. You have become a human doing and not a human being. We go back to captivity instead of being sons and daughters of God. 
We go back to captivity instead of being children of, children of the Most High God. In fact, Jesus spoke directly to this way of thinking, to this mentality. In John 15, 15, he said, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. Do you lay your hand on your heart and say, I'm a friend of God? You see, as long as you confuse your worth with your work, you're going to remain exhausted. Keeping busy trying to prove our worth is the easiest way to miss the life that God created for you to live. Your worth as a woman is not defined by how much you get done. Can I set you free today? It's not defined by how much you accomplish or how clean your house is, how organized your refrigerator is, or the fact that there's takeout food in there from three weeks ago. Gentlemen in the room. Hi. <laughs> Your worth is not defined by how much money you make. It's not defined by how much money you make. Your value is not based on what you do, but in whose you are. You're a son and a daughter of God. The Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you, and there is so much more that God wants to do in your future than what he's done in your past. We've declared it 50 million times in the service today. There's much more for you to accomplish. There's much more that the Father has for you. That's why you can stop striving because you're a son and you're a daughter of God. Here are some good indicators that your doing is exceeding your being. Listen, I can't shake the pressure I feel from having too much to do in too little time. I'm ignoring the stress and the anxiety and the tightness in my chest or in my body. I'm concerned way more than I need to with what others think about me. I'm often very fearful of my future. I'm always rushing. I'm defensive and I'm easily offended. I'm preoccupied and I'm very distracted. I fire off quick opinions and judgments on other people. I feel unenthusiastic about or threatened by the success of other people around me. I spend more time talking than I do listening. If any one of those apply to you today, and I think all of us could, all of this resonates with at least one or two, we have become more of a human doing than we have a human being. The Father desires that we would just be with him before we do anything in his name. Do you understand that? He wants us to stop and just be, not stop and do, not just continue this cycle of unhealthy living. Rest is your responsibility. I want you to say this with me. Rest takes work. Rest takes work. It's important that we set aside a time and a place to meet with God and with him alone. We have to set aside a time and a place. Can I tell you that the only way that you grow spiritually is by intentional time to rest in the Father's presence. It's not being busy. It's not being busy. It is not being busy. It is by setting aside a moment to be with him. If we're going to accept this invitation, then it's very important that we learn new rhythms of rest because everywhere in our culture, everywhere that you look, in your office, the grocery store, every place that you go, being busy is what we idolize. But we need to reinforce a principle called Sabbath. And for some of us, we're new in our walk with Christ, and you may not have heard that word, so I want to teach you about it for just a moment. Sabbath means to cease. So that the practice of Sabbath is simply this. It's taking a 24-hour time, a 24-hour period of time to step away from working, to rest, to enjoy life, to enjoy people, to enjoy God. Now, for those of you who understand what I'm talking about, and maybe you've tried this principle before in your life, you, you may say, PK, yeah, but I tried that. But then when I, when I tried to stop and rest, then all I could see was my to-do list, and so I just... I just went on with it. I just went to the, you know, to the grocery store and I went to pick up my dry cleaning and then I went to the office on my day off because that's what you do to get things done. I tried and it doesn't work for me. 
Well, listen, have you ever watched one of those competitive cooking shows before where you're given a set of ingredients and a set of time and, and everybody, you're competing with these, you know, lovely other chefs and uh, as the buzzer begins to ring, whether you're finished with the plate of food or not, you have to step back like this, right? Has everybody seen one of those on the cooking channel? Whether you've plated the food, whether you've added the confectionery sugar, you can't touch the spatula, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta back up. What if we tried that on this Sabbath and on this rest? What if we lay, laid down our devices and we laid down our to-do list and we said, I'm not done, but that's okay. That's okay because I'm gonna honor this time and this face with the Lord. Did you know that this is a position of surrender? God, I can't, but you can. When I'm resting, you're working. It's not when I'm working, you're resting. I give it to you. The most common question about Sabbath is what do I do? So we're going to sample what is life-giving. I want to help you for a moment. We're going to sample what is life-giving. So to each of us, that's something different. Some people may enjoy working out. Not one of those people. No thanks. Not today. Probably not tomorrow either. But if you do, I'm so proud of you. And we're all standing on the sidelines cheering for you. Go. That's awesome that you run 15 miles a day. Glorious. It's awesome that you carry 500 pounds with you. That's awesome that you lift that much. Great job. For me, I might just want to sit with somebody that I love over lunch. Maybe want to have coffee with somebody working out. No. Um, create. Read a book. Or even nap. Are there any Sunday afternoon nappers in the room? Okay, some church folk. For those of you who don't know, like, church stuff, like this is new to you, a lot of times church people like to take a nap after church on Sunday afternoons. Did anybody know that? It's just kind of this thing. I'm not one of those people, but glory to God for all of you who like to nap on Sundays. The challenge for us is that when we begin to get silent or when we pause for a moment, we will fill ourselves with substitute solutions. What is that? Binge watching Netflix, strolling through TikTok, all of the things that actually take life from us, but we're trying to get life from. This is our culture today, but we have to stop. Thirdly, we're going to sit in silence, and this is precious to me. Because real rest doesn't come from a day off. Do you know that? It doesn't come from a day off, but it actually comes when we're connected to God's presence. And I know this because God will speak the loudest to me when I'm the quietest. He will speak the loudest to me when I've shut my mouth and I've shut out the distractions around me. He speaks so very clearly when I'm not bombarded with things, to-dos, people, when I'm focused in on him. Silence is the discipline by which the inner fire of God is tended and kept alive on the inside of us. And that's what needs to be guarded in our life. For most people in this room, silence creates an itchiness and a nervousness. You don't quite know what to do. We just, we want to fill the space with something. It's funny, have you ever had a conversation with a nervous talker? They just got to fill the space. La, 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 la. They just keep talking. Silence. Silence is beautiful because in silence we let go. We surrender our will to God's will. It's an invitation to surrender control to the one who knows all things, to the one who is all things, to the one who is worthy of all things. In silence we actually change. It, it begins to shift the way that we pray. And we're no longer praying the things that we want, we're, but we're praying the will of God for our lives and for our family and for our children and for our church and for our city and for our nation. In silence, we let go of our agendas. We let go of everything that is not like our God to possess this place of communion with the Father. And that has to become the core of our lives. Somebody say amen. amen. In silence, we let go and allow God to deeply, deeply transform us. Thomas Keating says it like this. 
He compares God's work to that of an archaeologist who's digging, who's excavating soil layer by layer. And in the unearthing of those places of soil, there is treasure, there is structure, there is beauty to be found in the unearthing, or there is dirt that is found in the unearthing places. And the Holy Spirit is the great archaeologist of our lives, and he is the divine one who digs through the layers of our lives revealing things to us when we sit in silence. Last year, we celebrated our 15th year of being in Tampa Bay and being a part of City Life Church and our beautiful church. You blessed us with a trip and we couldn't take the trip last year because my daughter was going away to college and we just didn't feel like we had enough time to plan a trip. So we waited and we took the trip this year. We just come back from that trip and it was beautiful. It was a wonderful time to be together with my babies and just listen to them and laugh with them. But I intentionally spoke to the Lord and I told him, I don't want to be distracted while I'm away. I don't want to check my email. I don't even want to check my text messages. I'll check on my mom and I'll check on my dog and that's it. That's it. I took three books and guess how many books I read? All three. I read all three books, you guys, in a period of 10 days. That's pretty amazing for me. But it's amazing what you can do when you're not distracted. Do you know that as I was sitting there and I would have moments to read quietly, the Lord began to reveal things to me. And what he began to reveal wasn't about my future. It wasn't about my family. It wasn't about our church. You want to know what the Lord revealed to me? He began to bring correction to me. Wow. Really, God? You know what he began to say? You're offended with this person and this person. And when you get home, you need to go back and you need to ask for forgiveness and you need to make it right. Because I do not want you to carry offense or unforgiveness in your heart and in your life because it pollutes your spirit, Casey, and I can't cause you to impact the world like I want you to impact the world if you're carrying an offense. So in moments of quiet and in moments of silence and in moments of solitude, the Lord doesn't always just come to you with a lavish love letter. He actually comes to you and brings correction to you. And the Holy Spirit inside of you begins to excavate the things that are not like our God. Because he desires for you and for I to walk in a place of wholeness before him. But what if I didn't go away? And what if I didn't take a moment to rest? And what if I didn't read those books? I would stand on this platform today full of offense to the people that had offended me. And I would have unforgiveness in my heart. And do you know what? I would not be as effective as I can be today because I've asked those people to forgive me. I took care of it already. So that's the, important, the importance of rest and solitude before the Father. He doesn't always just lavish you with his love, but he does bring correction to you when you're silent before him. Rest carries great risk and great reward. The Bible is filled with principles and commands for our lives and for living. Maybe the most famous are the Ten Commandments. We've covered it during this beautiful series. But I think it's important for us to understand that the commandments don't benefit God. The commandments benefit us as people. They make our life better by helping us. And they help us avoid problems and they also allow us to inherit blessing. Isn't that true? The fourth commandment is the one that I want to focus in with you today. And that is to keep the Sabbath or to regularly rest. To keep the Sabbath or regularly rest. And like all commandments, the fourth comes with a price, but it also comes with a promise. The price is what we pay for something. It's, it's what we pay for not following God's plan, but the reward is what we inherit for following God's plan or for following what he desires. Numbers 15, 
32, and I want you just to lean in with me. This is a little harsh, but I want you to lean in. The word says, now, while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. And those who found him gathering sticks brought him to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation. They put him under guard because it had not been explained what should be done to him. Then the Lord said to Moses, the man must surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him. This seems extreme, doesn't it? Wow. But it's important to understand today that in 1 Corinthians verse Chapter 10, verse 6, the Bible tells us that everything in the Old Testament is a physical picture of a spiritual reality. A physical picture of a spiritual reality. So in the Old Testament, it's important for us to understand that there were four things that required death. Murder. Adultery. Rebellious kids. Can you believe that? Rebellious kids and not resting. Murder is killing someone else. Adultery is killing your marriage. Tolerating rebellious kids is killing your future. But not resting is killing yourself. That's hard, that's harsh to hear, but this man refused to rest and it killed him. And that's a picture of so many of our lives. We refuse to rest, but I don't think it's helping us. It's actually hindering us. Let's move along to the promise. Isaiah 58, 14 says, if you watch your step on the Sabbath and don't use my holy day for personal advantage, if you treat the Sabbath as a day of joy, God's holy day as a celebration, if you honor it by refusing business as usual, making money, returning here and there, then you'll be free to enjoy God. Oh, I'll make you ride high and soar above it all. I'll make you feast on the inheritance of your ancestor Jacob. He's saying to us that if, if you do these things, if you honor the Sabbath, I'll raise you above and you'll enjoy abundance. I'll raise you above and you'll enjoy abundance. Now, something very beautiful that I want to point out to you, it's a picture of traditional Judaism. The family recites a blessing at the beginning of Sabbath. As Sabbath is beginning, a family just comes together and they begin to recite a blessing. The blessing is accompanied by a ceremonial Kiddush cup, which is an ornate goblet that has a saucer right under it. And as the family begins to recite the blessing, the father of the home will begin to take wine and pour it into the goblet. But the father doesn't just stop at the capacity of the cup. Why? Because the symbol, the symbol of Sabbath, the symbol of rest is is that your cup actually overflows when you rest. There is abundance when you rest. God blesses you in such a way that there is abundance. And how many of you understand that when God decides to bless somebody, there is nothing, nothing that can stop the blessing of the Lord. It cannot be contained. It cannot be stopped. But what's important for you and I to understand today that this is actually symbolic of your life. Some of you in this room, Your cup is absolutely empty because you've come to this place in life and you are done. You're fed up. People have hurt you. People have disappointed you. People have even walked out on you. You're even done with God. Your cup is empty. But can I tell you today that there is a father in heaven that if you will honor a a place of rest, if you will get before him and bring your disappointments to him and actually kneel and carve out space to be with him in intimacy and in communion, he will take the oil of heaven, he will take the wine of heaven and begin to pour into you a blessing that you cannot contain. And guess what? Guess what? When your reservoir says... I'm full, guess what? He's got more, he's got more, he's got more, he's got more, he's got more. It's overflowing. It's overflowing. And that's what rest will do for us. Sometimes we think that it's just, it's just about the religion of this. But can I tell you, it's about the sweetest relationship that you and I have ever known. 
When we do what the Father says, when we come into covenant with him, when we follow the commandments of God, there is a place of communion with him. And I can I tell you, it's the sweetest thing that you've ever tasted. It's the most incredible place. Nobody will love you like he will love you. Nobody will heal you like he will heal you. Nobody will set you free like he will set you free. Why do I know this? Because I've been broken, because I've been exhausted, because I don't know the answers. I don't know what's in my future, but I know who does. I know who does. And if I will follow, if we will follow the commandments of God, there is a place of abundance. And I'm not talking about abundance so we can drive more cars or look cuter in our shoes. I'm talking about an abundance that is on the inside that flows out. That's on the inside that flows out. That is true abundance. It's not what's in your bank account. It's not how many friends and people who are following you. It's not how big this church is. It's not any of those things. The abundance that God desires for you and for I to walk in is a place of richness with him. Intimacy, communion, rest, worship, Sabbath, place carved out for him and for him alone. So today we're going to close service just a little bit differently. For some of you in this room, you've never had a Sila moment. You've never stopped long enough to hear God speak to you. You've never paused in the presence of God just to lean in. You've filled the space with your wants, with your needs, with your sound. But you haven't stopped to hear his sound. You haven't stopped to hear the voice of the Lord singing and delighting over you. That's the sweetest place that you and I could ever be. And so I'm going to invite you in a corporate Sila moment today. For some of you, you can sit in your seat, you can kneel, you can stand. I don't really care what it looks like. It doesn't matter. But I just want you to get alone with the Father. I want you to free yourself from your device, your Bible, anything that's distracting to you in this moment. A lot of times I find myself just kneeling in the presence of God because I want to be low. I want to be low. I want to be low. I want to hear what he has for me to say. I want to hear what he wants to say. Would you just take a moment and just breathe in? Father says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He doesn't say come to religion, come to rituals, come to regulations, come to rules. He says, come to me, and I will give you rest. The Father who created you, the Father who knows you, the Father who intimately designed you. He says, I desire to give you rest today. And I desire to create new rhythms of rest so that you can walk in fullness and abundance in your life. Not depleted, not distracted, not being overwhelmed by the noise of this world, but carving out a space where we can be free to hear your voice, Jesus. Oh, Would you just invite him in in this moment? I know for some of you this may be uncomfortable, but it's really just about being with the one you love, and that's the simplicity of it. It's just sitting with the one you love, and sometimes when you're with somebody you love, you don't even have to say a word because they get you, they see you, they know you before you even have to open your mouth. We just sit with you today, Father, and in the stillness and the silence, we ask you, Holy Spirit, Would you reveal to us through the words that were spoken today if there's any place in our life that you need to adjust, that you need to correct, that you need to heal? Is there any place in our heart, God, that we're holding on to something that is not like you? Lord, would you reveal it now in this Sila moment? Would you show us, God? Would you give us the courage to get up from this place again? and walk out the commandments of God for our life so that we can see abundance. Lately in my times of rest with the Lord, 
There's a song that has been helping me see myself in a safe place. And I love to see myself wrapped up in the arms of God. Because there's refuge away from anything that is not like God under the shadow of his wings. And as you're taking a moment to breathe, as you're taking a moment to see love, I want to sing this over you. We invite you here, Holy Spirit. Come and speak, Lord. In the shadow of Shaddai. In the shadow It is here I rest and here I hide. It is here I'm safe and satisfied. It is here I vow to spend my life in the shadow of Shaddai, in the sweet shadow of Shaddai, in the shadow Thank you for your sweetness in this moment, Holy Spirit. Thank you, precious Father, for teaching us a new system and a new strategy with which to go about our daily living. One that pleases you. Lord, that's really all we're after in this journey is to please your heart, to do exactly what it is that you desire for us to do in our jobs, in our families, with our finances, with our life, God. Thank you, Jesus, for reworking what needs to be reworked on the inside of us as we sit with you. And God, I pray that you would give us many more Sila moments. If you're extending this invitation to us to live differently, then God, may we RSVP yes. May we just say yes to you. May we not decline the offer, but may we show up to the banqueting table that you provide for us in your presence that is rich and nourishing and lovely and beauty beyond description. We love you, Jesus. Would you just tell him that today? I love you, Father. I love you. Thank you for causing me to come to a place of rest today. In the mighty and precious name of Jesus, we said together, amen. So be it. So be it. Thank you so much for watching this message. We pray that it encouraged you. Our church is not built on one individual, but on the sacrifice of so many. And so you being a part of that means so much to us. Our vision here at City Life is to reach the lost, help restore what has been broken, and to release people into their God-given purpose. If you would like to partner with us today, text GIVE to 844-311-1777 or visit our website. For more great content and messages, be sure to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also download our City Life app and follow us on Facebook and Instagram while you're at it. Our services are at 9.30, 10.30, and 11.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'd love to have you be with us in person at one of our locations. And like we say here at City Life, go and be the city.